All right, so welcome everyone to the Chemistry of Cannabis. My name is Natalie Cox. I teach the Anthropology of Cannabis course here, which is part of the Cannabis Studies program. And I'm very, very excited to um, introduce to you our speaker tonight, David Chen. He has a degree in chemistry from UC Santa Barbara, and he initially actually started his career in a wine testing lab. Um, so he'll tell us about that journey from wine to cannabis. Um, and he then went on to become a founding member of the Sonoma Labworks, which started out as an internal quality control lab for a large cannabis manufacturer. Now, in early 2017, Sonoma Labworks was one of the first cannabis labs to begin investing in high-end analytical chemistry equipment to begin testing for pesticides, which is now an industry standard. And in 2018, Sonoma Labworks became an independent testing lab, and it's become one of California's largest testing lab certifying over thousands of legal products a year in California. And so David is gonna share his screen and kind of go through a PowerPoint with us and we'll have some Q&A at the end. But if at any time you have questions, please feel free to stick it in the chat and I can read it aloud. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat throughout and I'll make sure that all your questions get answered. So go ahead, David. Take all right, on. thank you. And so everyone can see my screen all right? Yeah, I can see it, thanks. Sweet, all right. So like uh, Natalie said, Dr. Cox, um, my name is David Chen. Uh, I was the former lab director at Sonoma Labworks for about seven years. Um, Sonoma Labworks is located in Sonoma County, and we are a analytical testing lab, um, meaning if you go to any dispensary in California, frankly, any dispensary in any state that has legal recreational cannabis, it has to be tested through a pretty rigorous uh, testing standard uh, before it can be sold. And I'll kind of go over a brief history of the lab. I'll go over a history of testing uh, cannabis itself, kind of some misconceptions uh, people see, a lot of genetic misconceptions, and kind of like just my story in cannabis, what it's been like. I have started when it was medically legal. We call that kind of the gray area era. And then when it became recreationally legal, um, and kind of just, you know, what happened uh, during that transition. So first, quick quick start about um, Sonoma Labworks. I guess I'll start with myself. I did start uh, working at Gallo, E&J Gallo. They're a very large winemaker, uh, right shortly as 2015 started, 2014 started, sorry. Um, and then I was presented the opportunity to, at the time, start testing cannabis for Canacraft, uh, actually one of the largest cannabis manufacturers in the state. Um, during that time, they were mostly focused on one of their brands. And, at, and they were the pioneers of actually making sure at that time that the cannabis they were acquiring was good quality and was actually cannabis. And when I started, I had one uh, instrument, uh, one analytical instrument, and I was in a closet and I was next to a greenhouse. And all I was doing at that time was testing if it was actually THC, if it was actually cannabis. Um, and then we slowly just started growing and growing along with Canacraft. As Canacraft began wanting to do quality control checks on, on the vape oil they were making, okay, is there any leftover solvents in the manufacturing process? Um, what terpenes are present in the cannabis? Are they present in the vape oil cartridge afterwards? Are there pesticides? And so Canacraft grew and the lab grew alongside it. And before we knew it in about end of 2017, we were a fully fledged lab. We had invested frankly millions of dollars in equipment. Um, we had a whole staff, we had a whole team. And at that point, Sonoma Labworks then was sold to a different entity to become an independent testing lab. And that's where we kind of opened our doors as recreational started in 2018 to the entire California market and anyone who wanted to test with us. Uh, we always kind of credit Canacraft as our like father company, um, still great relationship with them and all of their brands, got a little shameless self-promotion for all of their brands right there. Um, but that's the story of Sonoma Labworks. And to this day, uh, they're one of the largest testing labs in Northern California. Um, they do all of the big brands. Uh, I won't bother to go through them, but if you, if you care to know, uh, I'd let you know. So testing cannabis, I, I hear this joke a lot. What do you do in a testing lab? Are you just smoking pot in the back and just saying it's good or it's bad? I've heard that joke too many times. So I'm gonna go over kind of the tests required for cannabis in a legal standpoint before you can sell it. Uh, the number one big test is potency. 
If you've ever been to a dispensary or purchased cannabis products, it's usually labeled, it has to be labeled with how much THC and CBD is in the product. Typically that's done in a percent and then a milligrams per gram. Flower um, nowadays generally range from like 18%, what's called total THC, um, all the way up to like 30% because growers are so good at growing flower nowadays. I'll go over kind of inflated values of THC, what total THC means uh, later on here. Um, but that's what potency is. It is a THC, is a CBD. There are other cannabinoids too that play a huge role in the effect that cannabis provides people, CBN, CBG. You know, it might sound like I'm just throwing out acronyms, but these are all important cannabinoids that play a huge part in the flower and then the products that, that are made from it. Uh, pesticides, of course. Um, you know, I hate to say this, but if you're smoking pot 10, 12 years ago, it was probably loaded with pesticides. I'm just going to be real with you right now. Um, the huh, testing for pesticides, the standard that California has set for cannabis products is frankly the most stringent and strict levels of pesticide testing across the states. It's frankly more strict than organic food. It's, it's like a joke in the testing world of cannabis that edible products in cannabis that you would buy in a dispensary is cleaner than organic food you would find at Whole Foods. And frankly, that is kind of true. It, it, there are action levels for uh, 66 pesticides in cannabis. And then there have what they, they have what they call category one pesticides, meaning you actually can't even detect the pesticide. If you do, that product fails. Um, and these are commonly used pesticides throughout the states. A lot of them are banned, um, but the, the levels allowed in cannabis are very, very low. It's uh, California decided to take what was allowed in organic food and divide all of that by half. Residual solvents. Now, when you go to a dispensary and you see, you know, the vape pens are the, the best example of kind of a, a manufactured cannabis product. I mean, that's a really broad category, but solvents are used in the manufacturing of the vape pens, the distillates. Um, I think like diamonds and sauce is a really popular product um, nowadays. And solvents can range from anything, uh, CO2, water is technically a solvent used in that process. Uh, a common one is ethanol. And so a residual solvent test is just making sure there's no solvent left over in your final product. Pretty straightforward. Um, that one technically has the most chance for, for health hazard, um, but generally we find most products are purged pretty well. And no one's usually getting their hands on crazy solvents and they wouldn't use it for manufacturing of cannabis goods. Uh, typically, we'll also go over how you can use crazy solvents to do some crazy stuff with cannabis later on here. Microbial contaminants, uh, pretty simple, mold, aspergillus, E. coli, and salmonella. E. coli and salmonella is of particular concern for cannabis foods. You don't wanna have a Chipotle-like outbreak in the cannabis industry, um, but uh, mold, aspergillus, those are pretty common uh, kind of problems for farmers across not just cannabis, but definitely in, in the cannabis industry. Um, so A, you wouldn't want to sell moldy weed, um, and B, we make sure that it's not a health hazard before it ever reaches the market. Heavy metals, um, that's going to be like lead, arsenic, cadmium, and mercury. It's actually those four exactly. Um, pretty straightforward. If it's present in your soil, cannabis is actually a really good soil remediator. remediator. Um, so it's going to pull up all of those heavy metals and unfortunately kind of disperse it throughout the plant. You really don't want to be smoking too much of, of lead. I mean, intuitively, you would think you want, don't want to smoke lead. Um, fun fact, fun fact, uh, during the wildfires up in Sonoma County for the, that happened two or three years ago and has kind of been happening since, we saw a huge rise in arsenic um, found in the testing of cannabis. And that's because the, the wind and the wildfires would actually deposit arsenic um, over outdoor grows. And so the, the cannabis plant itself wasn't um, absorbing arsenic from anything like a well water source, but it, it was having it deposited on top of the plant. And so there was a lot of research and uh, legwork done to see if there's a way to remediate that and, and salvage the cannabis. Um, unfortunately, smoke damage, smoke taint, which is common in wine, was an even bigger concern. Even though it didn't actually fail any test, can't really sell weed when it smells like smoke. 
uh, and then terpenes. So terpenes, we're gonna have a whole nother slide over, but terpenes are essentially what makes a blue dream a blue dream. It's what makes an OG an OG. It is the compounds that give it aroma, that give uh, the, its entourage effect. Um, THC by itself will just get you high, but when you add in terpenes, that's kind of what you get your, you know, on mis, mis common indica sativa, I'll go over kind of how those naming uh, conventions aren't quite correct, but that's, that's generally when you get the couch lock effect or your energetic effect, typically terpenes are responsible for that. Hey, David, could I ask a quick question that came up in the chat that I think yeah. would be interesting is there was a question of, is there a certified organic labeling for cannabis? Like in the same way that we see that with like food and other products? There have been organizations that try to set that up. The, the real distinction here is if it's being sold in a dispensary, it's already had the past. It, and I'll go over kind of what a test report looks like for, for sold cannabis or tested cannabis, but it's already going to have to have passed all of these levels. Um, in, in a sense, this uh, we call them certificates of analysis. This COA is your certificate. It's your certified organic because it's passed the very stringent um, requirements set by the state of California. And so that should be the next couple slides. I'll do this next slide here. A little bit of shameless self-promotion. Um, I was featured in the news five years ago in Santa Rosa. So that was, uh, that was our lab at Canacraft when we were still QC part. Um, you know, kind of hard to imagine that a manufacturing of cannabis, a manufacturer of cannabis had such an extensive lab. And then the second slide on the bottom right, that's what the lab looks like now. Now that it's an independent entity, um, all of the instrumentation are, are, you know, on display. You know, we used to have a lot of tours pre-COVID. Um, and, you know, we loved showing off the lab. Uh, it's a lot like CSI in the sense that the instruments are the same, but the work is not nearly as interesting um, as CSI portrays it to be. So what comes off an instrument? I understand this is like more of a anthropology of cannabis, not necessarily chemistry. So I'm just kind of going to show you, this is what we break cannabis down into at Sonoma LabWorks. Cannabis comes to us as a product, um, flower, edible. I have a slide with examples later, but at the end of the day, it's broken down into a graph and then even further down into numbers. And so what, what does that all mean? The top left one is kind of a general breakdown of like cannabis has been, we have removed and stripped all the chemicals from it. We've tested it with an instrument. We call them instruments, not machines. A machine is something you press buttons on and do. An instrument is something you have to be trained to actually utilize. And so the instrument will break down all of the chemical components that we're looking for and kind of quantify it for you. And so I, I like the analogy that these chromatograms are kind of like EKGs that you see at a hospital. Each blip indicates it has found something. And the bigger the blip, the more it's found. And so on the top right here, a pretty typical chromatogram for a potency breakdown uh, for, not for flower, but this is, they're running standards to kind of show you what's, what's being seen. Um, and then at the bottom is a trace chromatogram for pesticides. If you, ever, if you ever saw a sample with this many pesticides in it, um, it, it, that, it would be toxic. You, I would not suggest consuming it. Um, I have an example COA from Sonoma Labworks signed by yours truly, uh, December of last year, I think, 2021. I'm pretty sure it was last year. Um, and this is what, you know, flour that has been tested and is ready to be sold looks like. Um, behind the scenes action of a dispensary, a dispensary when they, when they get cannabis from a distributor, a distributor is someone who transport cannabis from position A to position B, um, it has to come with uh, one of these pieces of paper. Uh, and for some reason they require hard copies of each of these certificates of analysis. I don't know if they still do that. There was actually a huge pushback because you could pull it up on your phone, but, uh, and, and this tells you, A, it's passing all of the required tests. And you can see here, this top, top line, this is 27.79 total calculated Delta nine THC. Again, we'll go over that. Um, and then you'll also notice some tests are actually grayed out because solvents aren't used in the growing of cannabis, so that test wasn't required. And this particular product, uh, they opted not to test for terpenes, was an extra surcharge at Sonoma Labworks. And then you can see on the page two here, these are all the pesticides that are tested. It's all been cleared, no trace pesticides, 
no microbes. It's a really small font. You probably can't read it, but it's got four strains of aspergillus. We tested it for salmonella and E. coli, heavy metals, free of all contaminants. This is just pure, clean weed, ready to be sold. And well, I'm sure it's been sold now. And just a brief overview of kind of the different products that Sonoma Lab was tested. And to give you an idea, like cannabis comes in a ton of forms. Um, in the lab testing world, we were kind of in a weird intersection where we like were involved with manufacturers, growers, uh, distributors who would move it around and then dispense everyone except customers who would actually buy cannabis. Uh, the lab was a repository for you know, scientific information. So we would help clients who had a question on how to make something. Um, you know, you, you got your typical flower, which everyone should be familiar with, you know, your edibles, this is a little caramel product. Um, and then this is a distillate cart. Um, you just strap them into like your little battery and you smoke it, you get high, good stuff. Um, this one actually here is one of my personal favorite products. That's why I included them. These are like uh, pop rocks, but with THC in them, super cool. Uh, and you know, with the clients will do R and D testing with the lab. Um, sometimes we'll send sign NDAs. If you built a great relationship with them, they'll kind of ask for feedback on what, you know, how to get the product to be compliant a so that solvents are gone and that the potency is what it is. And that's always the tricky one. Um, putting THC into something that isn't fat-based is actually fairly difficult. Um, you've probably had a THC cookie or THC butter before, and that's because the butter is binding the THC in a sense and, and like holding on to it. And then when you cook with the butter or with the vegetable oil or whatever binder, um, that product becomes an edible. So like chocolates and caramels have a way to do that. But when you're doing like these kind of sugars or uh, the Lagunitas Hi-Fi hops, it's just water that's been emulsified with THC. You have to get really creative with how you get the THC in there and how you make it stable. Um, and so, you know, as a testing lab, we do a lot of help um, just kind of consultation wise. Um, and as we build relationships, you know, one thing is it, people saw a testing lab as this factory where cannabis goes in and a piece of paper comes out, but we try to educate our customers and honestly, anyone who cares to listen, everyone here, um, just kind of what goes on in these products and why they are the way they are. I mean, fun fact for cannabis beverages, we were the first lab to test them when they're in a can. I got to back up a little bit. Cans have plastic liners on the inside. So an aluminum can, uh, the aluminum isn't actually touching the beverage inside. If you think of your typical Coca-Cola can, we were the first lab to actually test a cannabis product that had emulsified THC in it. So it was a soda with THC in, in the actual beverage in a can. And when we did the testing initially, when they're still making and formulating the product, it came out within specifications, they canned the product. And then when it came back to the lab for testing in the can, all the THC was gone. And so everyone's scratching their heads, you know, fingers were being pointed. Um, and then we actually ended up cutting the can into strips, uh, removing the plastic lining from the inside of the can and then recovered THC from that. The lining had actually absorbed THC. It was a stronger binder than the emulsifier of THC in the beverage. So it pulled the THC out of the beverage and just turned it back into regular soda. It was actually really cool discovery. I believe they've designed cans now that have liners that prevent that. But early 2018, 2019, 2020, honestly, almost every cannabis beverage product was in a glass bottle because you couldn't use cans with liners in them and make a product that would stay uh, stable. So, you know, fun, fun stuff the lab does. All right, so I'll, this next slide is gonna be kind of sciencey. I hope, you know, it's five, six o'clock or whatever. I'm sure you guys don't wanna see stuff like this, but you had a quick chemistry lesson. I hope everyone's reviewed their organic chemistry. Um, THCA and THC, we'll start there. Everyone here, I hope, knows you can't just eat cannabis flower and get high. And the reason is, is because cannabis, the plant, produces THCA, tetrahydrocannabinolic acid. The acid doesn't bind to your cannabinoid receptors in a way that is psychoactive. And so this is focusing on THC. This will go for CBD as well. So if anyone who's interested in like CBD and how it interacts with you, same story, just replace the letters and the chemical structure is a little different. But heat, heat is what turns THCA into 
THC. Delta-9 THC, the delta-9 indicates where a double bond on the molecule sits, a little bit of chemistry jargon, but that's the most common THC because it's sterically favored and, and laws of physics require it. But heat is what makes THC psychoactive. No, that's the that's fact, that's incorrect. Heat is what turns THCA into THC and THC is psychoactive. And so that's why you gotta bake uh, your cannabis butter or, or, or whatever. So an edible, has THC in it, but the flower has THCA. And then there's also the not well understood, it's, it's more legality than anything, total THC. What is total THC? You buy, you buy Blue Dream at the, at the store, you buy your cookies or whatever, and it says total THC 30%. What does that mean? Total THC is a calculation. It actually doesn't mean, it's not like a scientific meaning of anything, but Total THC is the theoretical amount of THC that you would get if you heated up and decarboxylated all of the THCA. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse moving here, but THCA chemically is different from THC because it has a little like side group. It's the little extra O and OH on, on the uh, ring right here and heating it removes that. And so the idea is if something has 20% THCA, but you heat it up and smoke it, it loses a little bit of weight, like a literal molecular weight. And so it's not necessarily 20% THC that comes out. And the idea is if a, a little example calculation right there, 20.62% THCA, 1.27% THC, that's pretty common flower numbers. Flower is gonna be THCA heavy. Um, you get 19.35 total THC. There are kind of like fallbacks to doing it like that. Um, it's kind of hard. A lot of people don't agree how best to represent total THC. Um, but right now the state has decided on, on this calculation. So when you see total THC on flower, that's where that number comes from. Um, hey, David, sorry, can I interrupt you real quick? Absolutely. There were some good, um, there's some good questions in the chat that I wanted to kind of bring up before we move on from this topic. So one question was how accurate is the measurement in non-fat products? Like if it really says it's five milligrams of THC in a gummy, is it actually five milligrams? Or is this again, kind of an estimate on the assumption that your body's absorbing that amount oh, of THC? Yeah, so that's a two-part question. Um, when measuring the actual THC in the gummy, um, you know, all, all labs do it a little differently, but the, the main point is you're gonna collect uh, hundreds of gummies you're gonna, so depending on the gummy, there's a pectin-based gummy and there's like fruit-based ones. So they have different ways of like blending it all together. Um, however, you decide to blend it all. So you got a big old glob of gummies now, then you start testing that. And then you do some math and you're like, okay, well, technically it's 4.9 milligrams of THC in the gummy itself. If the product is uh, poorly made or stored improperly, it might not be five milligrams. Um, so, you know, all labs have like margins of error and uncertainty, but you know, all these labs are ISO certified in this stringent quality review process. And so when you say, you know, when you measure and test the gummy, you can eat it with confidence knowing that there is five milligrams in it. Now, does your body absorb all five milligrams of THC? You know, I'm not quite qualified to answer that. That's a, that's a question of like how, and, and science actually isn't even really there yet, which is due to the legality of cannabis. But how the body kind of absorbs and how bioavailable THC is to the body, it's gonna affect everyone differently. Uh, I'm sure everyone has stories of you ate that one cookie and then you couldn't move for like four hours. You know, I've been there. Um, some people can, some people can't. And it's just how your body absorbs THC. Um, you know, my advice for newcomers, you like do edibles. I always say, start with like two milligrams or five even five I find for someone who's never done it before might be a bit much, but I always say start low, start low, start low, start low. You know, I got, I got a story of my wife who <laughs> took, took a hundred milligrams once and forgot how to speak Chinese. So, <laughs> you know, the too, too much is not a good thing there, um, but how each person's body individually processes THC is something that hasn't been well-defined or studied yet. Um, so as, as a lab, what we try to do is break it down into numbers, keep it standard, and hopefully with enough data, uh, we can kind of learn and see how it interacts and affects everyone differently. Um, all right, back to THCA, THC. 
moral of the story on this slide, THCA, you need to add heat before it becomes THC. Remember the delta-9 THC, that's going to come back up later. Okay, so this next slide is kind of misconceptions. This is a big one, sativa versus indica. I know bud tenders across the globe, um, and I think like 90% of cannabis users know indica as in the couch, and sativa is kind of like stimulating, energy-boosting one. Um, However, it has been shown, a recent article actually, I think it released a couple months ago, um, has shown that indica and sativa are just like relics of a naming nomenclature that just kind of happened. Um, the physical characteristics of the leaves don't indicate, you know, has nothing to do with the genetic differences between sativa and indica. It's not, it's not the indicas that all, people just name them indicas, people name them sativa, um, but genetically it has been kind of proven that uh, an indica and a sativa are not what determine the relaxing or the sedative or the pain relieving effects. It's in fact terpenes and the entourage effect. Now, like the actual clinical data isn't quite there, but you know, speaking anecdotally, I've seen enough where, yes, terpenes, um, the chemical makeup that's not just THC of the flower is what makes um, some people enjoy Blue Dream or some people enjoy Jack Herrera more. Um, and it's what also gives it that distinctive uh, odor, uh, so to speak, and taste. And so the next, the, the entourage effect is kind of a well-touted, um, effect of cannabis and how terpenes interact with it. So to start, okay, uh, first off, I didn't make this, I shamelessly tore this off of C-N-E-N, -E um, link right there, so I won't take credit for that. But terpenes are found throughout nature. And so this might be a review for, for people who know anything about terpenes, but terpenes are produced by pretty much every plant. Um, and there's thousands of terpenes out there. Uh, cannabis expresses a wide range of them. And typically you will see generally the ones listed here in the highest amounts. They will have really tiny amounts of like very specific terpenes, but it has been pretty much determined that these ones are the ones that are giving you the effect that people are getting with like indicas or whatnot. Now, you know, um, beta caryophylline is a really common one. Uh, the oxide of that is what drug sniffing dogs smell and to determine that cannabis is cannabis when they're sniffing your luggage. Uh, limonene is a common one. Limonene, like the name suggests, is expressed a lot by citrus, lime being the biggest one. Um, linalol is from lavender. Uh, and I believe, someone could correct me if I'm wrong, it is the dominant terpene for like Jack Herrera? Or is that terpenaline? I'm going to take that back. I, I forget. Uh, myrcene, if you ever heard the rumor that if you eat mangoes and it like enhances your high, um, that's like a, a game of like telephone where it's because mangoes also express myrcene. So it's not scientifically backed, but mangoes are great whether you're high or not. Um, pinenes, you have an alpha and a beta. It's kind of just how the double bond is structured on, on that molecule, but that's kind of like that turpentine. It really gives off the earthy piney smell cannabis does, uh, expresses. Um, and so, you know, there, the individual terpenes have kind of scientifically proven health effects, whether or not they're expressed the same way when consumed as cannabis is still kind of up for interpretation right now, got a little typo right there, but you'll notice a lot of these have anti-inflammatory health effects, um, antibacterial, um, you know, myrcene supposedly has like the sedative relaxing effect, um, how that's expressed in the cannabis flower after you've smoked it um, isn't well studied and you know still something that anecdotally a lot of people say happens but from like a scientific point of view not so much um could, but could, sorry could you repeat which one it was that the drug dogs can smell the drug sniffing dogs which was oh, the one um so it's not actually listed here so beta caryophylline caryophylline oxide is kind of like a, a byproduct of that it's it's a related molecule i didn't list it here because it's not a typically large um, terpene molecule that's expressed by cannabis. Uh, in fact, it's actually a very small percent by mass expressed by cannabis, but the dogs can still smell it. Kind of goes to show like how olfactory senses work just because like 
you might have like 1% mercine being expressed and 0.1% uh, caryophylline oxide, the dog's still gonna key on on that 0.1%. You know, numbers don't mean much here because how it affects their, their you know, noses and olfactory senses is different. Um, and you know, I, sh I should have included it. Didn't think I'd make that drug dog sniffing reference. Notes for next time. Um, but yes, so entourage effect terpenes, way more important to pay attention to this than sativa versus indica. If, if, you, if you leave this slide with anything, just do that. If you, ever go, if you go to a dispensary, you know, key question is what kind of terpenes are being expressed? You know, you got to do a little bit of research yourself. If you see one that's high in line, linalol, you smoke that, you don't like it, you know, take some notes uh, and then try it again, smoke more pot. Sorry, one last quick clarification on the beta caryophylline is that yes. is, it, is it also a cannabinoid, and that's partly mm -hmm. why? No, it's um, they're they're all related, and you know that's kind of like a really deep chemistry question. They are not a cannabinoid. A cannabinoid is something that interacts interacts with our endocannabinoid system. The terpenes, like the basic definition of a terpene, is it's they're all created with kind of like this Lego piece. Um, chemical building block. It's hard to visually see it, but all of those chemicals on screen share like, it's called an isoprene unit. And that's what makes it a terpene. Um, they are similar in cannabis chemically in, in some senses, but they are not cannabinoids. Um, why dogs are trained to smell caryophylline oxide? Good question. Um, but that's what they, they smell for when they, they smell cannabis. Um, I don't know if dogs, I don't know if you get in trouble for having weed in your luggage at the airport. Actually, I have no idea. Don't, don't bring weed on an airplane. Not yet, not yet. Um, but uh, another, uh, not really a misconception here, but more so just a distinction that I think is important to make here is like, what's hemp? A lot of people ask, what's hemp? What's cannabis? Why can I buy CB, hemp CBD gummies at Walgreens or wherever you can buy those, but I can't buy THC or like there's, there's also CBD products in a dispensary. What's the difference here? Uh, the 2018 Farm Bill is the reason why you can do things like that. Hemp is on a legal definition. It's kind of weird. Um, anything from the plant, which includes for, for some reason, like the roots, the stalk, seeds, all of it, if you ground all of that up, is there less than 0.3% total THC? And we, we're going back to that total THC number now. It's different states find different ways to calculate it. The FDA um, have determined, is it FDA? Well, one of those three letter government organizations have determined 0.3% total THC. If it's below that, it is hemp and you can use it to manufacture hemp CBD. And that's where you get hemp. And so well, what does that mean? Like, well, why can you sell hemp CBD versus non-hemp CBD? Well, hemp CBD has no THC in it. So the idea is it is no longer cannabis. And so it no longer falls under the umbrella of the category one drug that is THC cannabis. Um, some people who frequent like gas station stores might have seen like Delta eight THC products. If you guys are taking notes, Delta nine THC is the most common uh, THC that is created when you heat THCA. What's Delta eight? There's also a Delta 10. Uh, what are those? Those are THC that's created under unfavorable conditions. Meaning if you just left weed out for a while, um, even hemp, small amounts of delta-8 are just naturally created because of like oxidation or other kind of environmental factors that make it. But a weird loophole that some manufacturers have found is if they artificially make delta-8 THC, it's technically not delta-9 THC, so it's no longer like the category one cannabis. And so you can sell that. Um, you know, I, I recommend against purchasing delta-8 THC kind of a problem in the, in the manufacturing world is you, you get really smart people who know, you know, it's a basic chemistry problem to make Delta-8 THC. Um, but there's no health 
research done on it, you know, it, I think it's a little irresponsible to start making it and start consuming it without doing any kind of health research. Realistically, it's probably not that bad for you, but, you know, I think that kind of thought process isn't the best. Um, there is a fun way of turning CBD into Delta-8 THC or Delta-9 THC. I've, uh, you know, plenty of brilliant chemists have looked at the structures here and just said, well, if you, um, turn CBD into Delta-9 THC, Delta-8 THC, you can grow hemp and then turn it into cannabis. Is that cannabis? Can you sell that across state lines? Can you grow a bunch of hemp in Georgia, move it over to California, which technically, yes, you can, because again, hemp is not federally illegal. And then can you turn that hemp into cannabis with chemical processes? Um, you would use acid to catalyze the reaction of CBD to some form of THC, neutralize the acid, remove the solvent, but, um, you know, there, there's a lot of loopholes that are still kind of in play here. And I think that's kind of the moral, it's kind of the story of cannabis, honestly, cannabis has always been, you know, the, that gray area. And I, I like to think that we have moved past that, but I'm sure some people haven't. Honestly, I think it's a great, a very clever loophole. I, I don't recommend, you know, large scale manufacturers grow hemp and then turn it into THC products. Um, but it is a way of, I mean, actually it's just fascinating chemistry. I think it's fascinating. I don't recommend Delta-8 THC products. That's all you can get, go for it. Some people say Delta-8 is less potent than Delta-9 in, in terms of how it affects the body. I can't speak to that, um, but that's why you will see some CBD products and your Whole Foods and other CBD products at a dispensary. I guess the distinction there is CBD products in a dispensary have come from specific cannabis strains that produce CBD more than THC, but they still have enough THC in there where it's considered cannabis. The distinction being 0.3% total THC. Um, you know, and I was hoping that's kind of the end of the slide. I didn't want to give everyone a full blown lecture at 6 p.m. on a Thursday. Um, so for the rest of the time, I figured, you know, we can just talk about um, kind of my experience. Um, any questions? I think there's a lot of questions in the in the um, little chat, I think. Uh, so yeah, I can take time to answer you. those. Yeah, thanks, David, so much. So what I'm going to do now, everyone, is I'm going to go ahead and um, actually stop the recording so that we can have some Q&A and then people can, we can all see each other and people won't have their faces recorded for this. So I'm going to go ahead and stop it. And then um, 